<laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of the Worldcraft Club show, a show for writers who want to create rich, immersive settings for their audience to get lost in time and time again. Here we have a guest who is a member at large on our server, Rach. How are you doing, Rach? I'm doing a-okay. <laughs> And I'm your host, James. Did I say that at the beginning? I feel like I might have. I can never tell. I've got this, like, it just pours out of my brain now. Um, so <laughs> we wanted to talk about food, right? So this is part of a three-part series that we're working on. Uh, basically, my son has a book called From Chewing to Pooing. It's essentially that. Uh, we're talking farming, food, and then sewer infrastructure, but really just infrastructure in general. And I like that theme running through. So you're on thankfully, the food week, um, where we're going to talk a little bit about uh, just kind of just how food impacts your world building, right? Like, what are some of the things that we've seen in, in worlds that have like inspired us and drawn us to be like, oh, man, like, I've got to, I've got to put some effort into my food game here. And um, I think it's safe to say as well, like a lot of worlds are sort of missing this you know what i mean there's like they're missing they're missing a trick sometimes by not diving into um into their their food essentially and having it available so oh, like yeah yeah go for it fire but, away um, you look you look primed <laughs> food is i think it is such an important factor in, in our lives it has been a symbolism of uh life because it does mm. give us sustenance and nutrients yeah. and, you know, keeps us alive. And to have it, like, food also is such an important, um, you know, factor, detail of um, how a culture um, behaves and how a character mm. even behaves. And I, I'm a little sad that it's not really something that people jump in on when they world build. Like, sure, they'll maybe show, like, bits and pieces if they're doing, like, a wide shot of, like, oh, we're in a market kind of deal. But, you know, I feel like the only very specific pop culture, um, you know, franchises that show that kind of stuff is, like, the little bit about Lumbus bread in Lord yeah. of the Rings. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really fun. And then also, you learn so much about hobbits when they go through every single different meal of the day. Um, yeah. And that's a small domestic thing that they, they go through. Um, but it's, it's a part of their daily life. And you can't have that, those characters without the context of this is what they do yeah. in order to be this person, to keep this lifestyle and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, food is really important to me. Yeah. It's well, I mean, it's it's important to everybody whether they know it or not, right? Like and you, you kind of get this cross section of society, you know, foodies who like are really really into their food and they say words like mouthfeel without giggling after and like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but like it's that they but but it's such a rich part of everybody's life and everybody's experience with one another. It's incredibly communal in nature as well. And like I, I one of the things I've actually been thinking about is um, if you look at a lot of uh, of Jim Crow laws in the South, they were aimed at effectively stopping black people and white people from eating together, because if people eat together, they bond. And the goal was to prevent that sort of ability to bond. And, and there's, a, there's an othering in making people sit at another table, like when to, to eat or not to share silverware or cups and things like that. As it's just an interesting thing. That's kind of like, it's the other, other side of it, kind of the, the, the icky mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of some of the stuff there. But like, it's indicative of this thing where it's like, if you want to stop people from forming bonds, you stop them from eating together, you know? And it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of, I, I just found that fascinating as sort of like, again, sort of the other side of the coin from that, where it's like, there's so much beauty in it. And as you say, like the hobbits eating is a big part of, it's what they do. I'm watching the extended editions now. And I realized I've actually, I, I haven't actually watched this, this, the extended editions. I realized I'd seen 
lots of parts of them. And I was familiar with like that, you know, that they encounter Saruman and two towers and things like that. But like, there's a lot more food in it. Like, then uh, I think I realized like it's they actually have like Mary and Pippin finding Saruman's storehouse and finding like the pipe weed in there and all sorts of stuff that he had on hand. And uh, it's it's kind of, it's neat to see that to watch a world expand on it. I've begun to notice it more, you know, is there uh, anything that sticks out to you as like a setting that really embraced food as part of its world building that really stood out? Oh gosh. Um, that is such a good question. Uh, I think one of the most obvious ones is Harry Potter of there's at least for me, yeah. Yeah. of, well, you have this a good point. infinite feasts. You can get almost anything that you want. And then that goes down a pipeline if you think harder about it, of where is this coming from? Why is this happening? Um, and then questions about how does this affect this endless cornucopia affect these people who already have the world at their fingertips because they're magic users yeah um uh but yeah the the visuals of the the movies of having all the different kinds of feasts and very special like party events and just the way that everything's summoned at like the wave of a hand is i mm. think it's incredible and they just have created some very popular um like like fantasy foods that we've been creating today like butter for beer. example butter exactly exactly <laughs> the description of butter beer just makes you want to drink it like it's yeah or like in um in uh uh, uh oh god uh the the line the witch in the wardrobe mm. um Turkish convincing delight. everyone that Turkish delights are delicious and things to betray I your love heart. Turkish <laughs> delights. They're so good, actually. They're so good. Yeah. Uh, it kind of also yeah, depends no, on right, where though. you get them. <laughs> True. Yeah. I mean, like, and rose flavor is a weird one mm. to get used to, but it is incredible. And, like, that's the thing is, like, at, we I actually did a production of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe in which I was Mr. Tumnus. And, mm. um, they uh, they sang a song about Turkish delight that sticks in my head. Was it? It was a uh, Turkish delight, Turkish delight, chunky and chewy and sweet and bright. And then it would go sticky and soft right to the core. Like and it was it was just a blast. That was like our 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 queen. Um, I was not really in it for my singing voice, but the queen, she was, she sang it with like such power because she was the one singing it to, uh, you know, little Edward, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so it was, uh, it, 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 yeah, you're right. Like that sticks out as like something in that, that like it popularized a food. And like one of the things that Su Suzanne, my wife, like would keep asking me, because uh, I, I hail from Britain and she would mention food from Harry Potter and she didn't know if it was magic or British. And like, I got a lot of that, like pumpkin pasties, magic or British. The pasties are British. Putting pumpkin in them is magic. <laughs> like, and that's like, so it was like figuring out like where, where those crossovers were because people would be like, oh, is that real? Like I'd have people talk to me about regular British food and be like, that's a real thing. And I'm like, yeah, no, no, it's it's real. <laughs> it's like that's not it's not magic. They'd be like butterbeer. It's like no, that's not real, except in Universal Studios, mm. where it is very real and delicious, and tastes like you imagine it would. But yeah, no, it's it's. I, I think it has a way of transporting you into the setting, right? Like it makes you feel like you're there, like because eating stuff is. Uh, I, I think Jim Gaffigan has a comedy sketch where he's basically just like. Really, vacation is just about eating in different places. Like, it's just like going to another place to eat and be like, oh, how about we eat a little bit and then we hang out at the water slide and then eat a little bit more. <laughs> you know, go back and eat something. And I'm like, yeah, that is how vacations work, <laughs> you know. But it's unnoticed, right? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. It's like something where 
I don't really people say that like they go places to eat the food and stuff, but it's mm. that's usually just like the foodies. I that's true. The the actual travel to eat the food on purpose. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, and that's right on. People like everyday people will be like like talking and like exchanging word of mouth like oh is this place tasty or is this <clears throat> like restaurant good but um i don't know a lot of i feel like a lot of people these days don't like um put more intention into um food and just go on like uh, autopilot and just eat mm. to survive Mm. Although that also does say a lot about people and characters as well. Like, you'll learn a lot about someone who has been described as eats, like, only peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Or, oh gosh, my brother, he has ADD. And as a person who was seven years younger than him, growing yeah. up, it was did not make sense to me why the only things he ate um, were like Stouffer's um, like meatloaf and yeah. uh, like Tostito chips, like the cupped ones and yeah, the yeah. like bean dip and stuff. And I just thought it was like, he doesn't even know how to cook pasta and I'm seven years younger than him and I know how to cook pasta and he's just eating all this stuff. Now, as an adult, knowing that, you know, people who are neurodivergent have specific safe foods that help mm -hmm. them with processing their daily lives and getting through. Yeah, that says a lot about who he is and uh, adds in a lot of like the context of how he works or... Yeah, you know, I could go on a deep dive about like the culture behind people who are getting into, uh, you know, s s brewing at home, like meats yeah. and such, or yeah. uh, the the science behind fermentation. It says a lot about specific people and their interests, but also the cultures that feature a lot of that. For example, Japan has a lot of pickling practices fermentation mm. practices with that um and i think it's so cool that an island country and culture um has found such amazing ways to preserve food and incorporate that into their uh cultures you know history i, I, I often think about it a little bit like george washington carver and peanuts like yeah. The guy just went ham on peanuts and was just like, here's everything I can do with peanuts. I feel like if you meditate on any one specific facet of cooking, like even mm. preparation, like pickling or fermentation, or you focus on one particular food and that's all you get, you get mighty inventive and you get to be able to sort of discern the particulars about things. You know what I mean? Like, cause it's, it's, uh, again, hailing from Britain, another Island nation, we do terrible things with pickling, um, that are probably, <laughs> that are just disgusting to most other people. And it's like Branston pickle and like, uh, you know, a whole bunch of our like preserved foods are just like their ration, their ration foods from World War II. And I think it has something to do with being an Island nation as well as I think sometimes if you get hit with a famine, like it's harder when like it would be easier to get hit with it through your entire nation and then you know you're stuck sailing for food and um you know i think that adds complexity which i, I wonder if that maybe contributed to you know preserve the food you know when you can you know like uh kimchi comes to mind as well in korea mm. like as a uh i guess my, my buddy used to watch old korean war movies and they whenever there was war coming everyone would go quick get the kimchi <laughs> they, would, they would run with it like that's like it's amazing but like yeah yeah and then you get remarkable fusions of food I, there's a place near us called korea licious that makes um kimchi burritos okay that are actually just mind-blowing like uh just whole other level like of delicious and that's it. like yeah you get your fusion foods like mm -hmm. it's just that's always fascinating to be
Uh, and I know, I, I watch a lot of food documentaries, and I know that there's at least, like, one or two Vietnamese restaurants in Louisiana, and I think it's yeah. such a poetic combination of uh, cultures and specifically cuisines because Louisiana is heavily French um, yeah, yeah. influenced and Vietnam was colonized by the French. And then Makes of sense. course yeah. the food combinations of um, like Louisiana, Southern food and it's French influences um, mixing with the like, French Vietnamese food and then you just have like the best bon mi ever or yeah. spiciest pho oh gosh I'm, I love food oh. but yeah it's just like That's having nice. that context of not of course these will combine perfectly even though they seem yeah. like they don't mix as yeah. well because you have all this history of a, a country that you know by degrees of separation unites you two. Mm. Yeah, that that is an interesting thing to throw in there as well, is that like, so food can also represent the union of different cultures and that kind of expression can be really, really unique. It's something to be like cognizant of if you're world building, you're creating borders. Along those borders, you're gonna get some interesting combinations of potential like food that you're going to get from each culture and it's um yeah i think i think that's an interesting thing as well when that draws in and even like a, a mingling of uh because because food is often used in like religious practice as well and like some food is profane in some cultures and is uh, and is acceptable in others and that there's practical things to that there's also religious observance elements to it and so it's like it's it's an interesting hodgepodge and combination there and i understand like you had some thoughts on like sort of mythologies and food practices that you wanted to throw in oh yeah like because food is such an important part of life uh, there it it's not i wouldn't say it's not as common but there are a handful of you know food myths and not to be confused with food myths about, like, you know, MSG food myths, kind of dealio. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But, like, um, there's, for example, like, moon cakes is, moon cakes have a little bit of history in mythology with the moon goddess, Chang'e. Yeah. Whoever's listening, please uh, uh, excuse my pronunciation. I <laughs> I am Chinese. I am also adopted, and I never went to Mandarin school. Um, but uh, Chang'e, uh, the moon goddess, she uh, there is a relationship with um, her and her husband and her leaving and him put, putting out a feast of some of her mm. favorite foods and one of them is also uh the moon cakes that we have today symbolizing prosperity um and just such a popular dish during a lot of chinese festivals um yeah there's of course like in greek mythology relationships with i guess not specifically food itself but using a lot of like god's actions relating yeah. to using food as um like political moves for example like prometheus uh tricking the gods into making sure that like humans have um a chance uh, to be um having some power in their relationship with the gods of you know hiding bones underneath um i i believe it's like the bones underneath a whole bunch of fat and stuff to convince like the gods that oh that's the more um a, um delectable pile of um food therefore use that as your offerings when mm. 
he actually hid under, I believe, hides all the actual meats and stuff so that the humans yeah. could have that instead. Um, of course, that left him to his downfall uh, or um, his uh, fate of being changed and having his liver uh, eaten out every day. But um, there's also, of course, the so stories gross. of famine. Yeah. It's it's crazy. It's yeah. <laughs> I love cyclical. I, I love hate cyclical. Um, results isn't the right word. I've been losing a lot of words lately. <laughs> <laughs> like I can think of the word before it, but not the word after it. Like it's a crime. <laughs> but what's the other thing? But anyways, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, is. Of course, there's multiple famine stories um, mm. across um, every culture, uh, yeah. specifically in Greek mythology, of the story of you know Persephone and Hades and the Demeter in mourning causes a complete um, famine across the world, um, really showing you how important um, fertility is in um food and sustaining life or uh even specifically athena i'm really big in greek mythology um yeah. <laughs> athena and poseidon's competition over athens and yeah. how poseidon thought well i'm um like a spring of water is perfect but it ended up being salt water while athena strategically chose the olive tree as mm her uh, contender for uh, um, whoever the uh, Athenians chose as their patron god. And it's a tree that overcomes the, um, the harsh you know, earth that surrounds Athens. It is a sturdy tree that can provide a lot of structure for folks, as well as a prosperous tree that provides fruit that has multiple uses, either mm. as regular olives, turn that into olive oil. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And it is the perf it is the perfect choice for the goddess of wisdom and strategy. Mm. Um, but yeah, um, those are the yeah. main ones that come to mind. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's right on. And it's like, it's this idea that we, I, I think food is significant. And therefore, it is often imbued with significance. You know what I mean? It's kind of like it's important to live by. But then your food also becomes part of a clear national identity. Like even talking about like Greek olives, like that's that's a thing. You know, like that's an important thing. You know, it's it's other countries. You know, have have really specific foods that they're famous for. I think about like French brie and stuff like that. You know, it's there. There's significance in that. I didn't know. I didn't know quite how rich the uh olive olive ran through uh through greek blood but like that's that's a huge thing as well you know um and i think i think this is one of those things where it's like you can you can talk about nearly element every element of life and find some way that you can sort of involve food and I think a lot of writers miss a trick because it's it's very easy to incorporate it because it's everywhere. You know, there's always a reason to eat. It's like we have holidays here in America devoted just to eating. Like it's Thanksgiving. It's like it's just the day where we eat turkey. You know, it's, it's essentially it, you know. Um and they just sort of gave up at that point. They were like, what's the significance? It's, oh, well, we're just going to eat, you know. And it's uh, there's plenty of holidays like that. You know, it's any excuse for people to get around the table together. They will they will go together to eat. It's the same. It's like it's uh, any sort of meeting you want to have. If you want to make sure people come to it, promise food and people will show up to eat, you know. Um, and so I think that means that like every religion is going to have that. I think about even... Um, you know, really, really specific principles around um, around Shabbat, uh, like kind of uh, specific uh, Friday night meals. Like there are, you know, this is uh, this it's bread brought from the earth, and you're supposed to like there's a, there's a blessing, and then there's a blessing over wine, and like all this kind of stuff. It all it all plays a role in religious observance and practice, and of course Passover and stuff like that as well. That uh, you know, 
uh, some of our listeners may be familiar with. It's it's it all has very specific, rich, meaningful cultural practice that's uh, that's rooted in in the history. And I think it would be even kind of I I don't even think as a writer you'd have to detail much in it. So I I realize that as a DM I am a cozy core uh, DM. Like it's just what I do. I I never genred myself like that but it's it's true and um in the game of D D, i'm doing uh not D, it's uh it's traveler but mm. in that there are loads of traditions that i built around food that characters like encounter really frequently in it so like uh one is like they live on this very kind of poor world where they're eating you know, they eat a lot of fish. And so they have a, a fish grain sort of gruel that is commonly eaten there and has become a delicacy that's actually eaten by everybody, even though it kind of started mm. out as we have to eat this because it's the only thing we have on hand. And it's like, you know, you got your protein, you got your carbs, like it's like a good start. Like, and um, so it was kind of like necessary food that became a cultural food. And then you have uh, drinking tea. It's most of the planet is comprised of a race called Varger, who are um, dog-like people. And so they're going to drink by lapping their tea. And um, oh. so you would theoretically then have to wait for the tea to cool a little bit longer because you don't, you know, like sipping, you can almost kind of like bring in a lot of air and you can kind of bypass, like you can slurp your tea a bit and like avoid, mm. like if you're just really eager to get a quick drink. But if you're a dog and you got to lick it up, then you're going to want to wait until it's cool enough that you can submerge your tongue in it. And so um, they drink tea in bowls. And part of the ser- part of tea drinking is, 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 is holding the bowl and so you wait and you you hold the bowl and let it cool off uh, let it cool off in your hands and the idea is in that time you would talk and so it's based a little bit on um on turkish coffee brewing principles where Mm. they'll take 20 minutes to brew the coffee and the point is you're supposed to talk and like that's not something i think we have a good strong hold of in the west is is that relationships take time and like I, I actually i say that very broad strokes but i think about france with taking an hour and a half to eat my wife once went to a wedding in in denmark and the the meal lasted four hours the meal lasted four hours they were up all night toasting uh so much so that when she got up she like stumbled out of her chair because she hadn't realized quite how much champagne she'd been drinking <laughs> through the course of the night because it was just another toast another toast another toast she just <laughs> kept drinking and drinking and mm-hmm. it was like and it's, it's, I feel like it's, yeah, I, I think I'd probably center it more in America and probably Anglo sort of cultures where it's like, get the food in your mouth and like move on, you know, it becomes a very functional thing. But I think in a lot of other cultures, taking time and, and resting around a meal seems to be a very important thing as well, like interrupting your, your eating, <laughs> like effectively to eat better. <laughs> oh yeah, food has always been very communal for me very um Mm. um built on building relationships my mom's chinese my dad's half italian and um i never got to meet my italian grandmother but i've Mm. seen photos and heard stories a lot of um easter and how everyone in the family would help out making her famous ravioli of yeah. you know, rolling the giant sheets of pasta out, everyone gla- uh, grabbing a glass and cutting out the ravioli. And we have a large family on that side. And so yeah. I can only imagine, and I have seen some of the photos of how happy and joyous and um, I don't know, respectful everyone is helping each other out, the kids getting their first try at making their own food. And then on the other side, uh, on my mom's side, um, we make a lot of pot stickers, especially for um, big events. And my mom and I like to organize um, pot sticker making parties. It's a great way to um, invite someone you already know really well, someone you'd like to get to know really well, and someone new that you've met, um, you've never met, where you get to teach each other how to make a little parcel of food little parcel of food that represents mm-hmm. a lot of prosperity and then it, it's a lot of you know learning more about each other and 
talking with each other and still being able to talk with each other while you're waiting for all of the pot stickers to uh, be made. Um, mm. it's like everyone has a great time. It's um, those two cultures are very big on the uh, time communal taking the time and you know putting in the intention into creating what you um, are about to eat and it, it, it gives you a little bit more uh, respect and um, I don't know um, love for what you're about to eat as well because you made that you did that with the love yeah. of you and your friends completely unrelated both of those are parcel foods and uh, there's something in my brain about how there's a lot of parcel-like, dumpling-like foods across the world in the same way that, that every culture has their own flood story kind of deal. Very there's something efficient. there. Yeah, speaking of pasties, <laughs> like, I, I actually, I make pasties, like, as well. Like, I, I grew up in Cornwall. Hmm. And, um, yeah, like, another parcel food. And it, it is just self-contained. They said, um... The, the, the thing about it is they used to have it where on one side of the pasty, you would have like meat and gravy. And on the other mm. side of the pasty, you'd have jam and cream. And you could mm. have the whole, that way you could have the whole meal in one, in one pasty and the miners would take it down. And the thing that they joke about is like you had the, you had the side was, was sort of woven tight. Mm. And yeah. so the idea was you could hold it and you could throw away the crust, but no sane Cornishman would do that. So it's just kind of like, that's just not what you do. You eat the whole thing. It's like, there's no way a miner would have wasted that. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I love that. I love that. Like, I think this is something to be aware of. I th and again, like I've localized it to America, but like y you and I are basically Americans. Like, <laughs> you know I mean, like we are like, and we see, we, we, we've lived in families that took time you know, to eat. Mm -hmm. So so those traditions do vary, but I, I do feel like I think with the advent of things like fast food and stuff like that, um, it's been, it's kind of fascinating to me, like how some of that, that time taken to eat, it's become too functional. You know what I mean? And I think that's something mm -hmm. that I would challenge any author to do because I think um, I, I honestly would challenge an author to try to linger too long on the food. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I think yeah. that would actually be hard to do because I, I like one comment that Seth had made the last time we, we did a food related episode is he talked about Redwall and uh, mm. Brian, I, I want to say Brian Jacques, it might be Jax. Uh, but um, in, in, in his books, like, there was these long, lavish descriptions of the feasts they were having similar to... Um, similar in in a lot of ways to um rowling and uh and harry potter and and mm -hmm. other books i can think of even like the the podcast rpg for you and me is a great podcast they they live in a cyberpunk dystopia kind of setting and they have they do lots of descriptions of like street meets and stuff that they encounter mm -hmm. and like you can tell that they've just had they have a relationship with <laughs> with street meets <laughs> like and that there's a rich enjoyment of it but i genuinely think I would I would challenge our viewers to find me one time in a book where they were just like, you went too long on the food. Because I'm not sure that it exists. Like, I think you could complain about Tolkien talking too long about walking around in landscapes. I think you can, you know, there's a lot of things you can complain about authors just taking way too long on. I don't think I've ever read a book where I was like, too much food. I'll Ease take off that the challenge. Food. I can yeah. talk a lot about food. Yeah. I'll put that like, into my story. Yeah. That would be that would be my thing. And I I think we can probably we can probably wind it down there unless there was unless there was something else that you wanted to like bring up. I feel like I've I <laughs> monopolized the time a lot, but like what do you think? Anything no, else? No. I uh I can't. I think we covered a lot of good stuff. I'm glad that I didn't go off about food science and food. <laughs> um but yeah, I think Ending on the communal part and then also a challenge is perfect. I don't know. I just have the image of a lazy Susan in my head right now. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, that's just that's just sticking there. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I'm really, I'm really fed up with how isolated I feel. Like on this, okay, just a little more tangent on the subject of oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how, like fast food, and all all the monotony of eating these days. I feel so isolated. I think part um, as like an adult living on my own. Partially, I think, because I'm not at home with my parents eating dinner every night. Um, because of that whole com community and interactions that we had, um, I still have some, you know, implements of eating with my family from, like, I was on, um, like, setting the table. That was my job kind of deal. And I don't have that with my roommate. We have completely separate um, utensils, utensils, schedules, yeah. um, and so even though I'll buy all the things that I I need to do my usual job, it's not really possible unless it's a special occasion or something. And there's no guarantee he'll even eat the food that I make, kind of deal. Yeah. Um, versus my mom making wontons and calling me over to go taste test some stuff um 15 minutes before we're actually going to go serve up everything kind of deal i don't know yeah i feel sad yeah. too i feel <laughs> sad too now i i so um no i really get that what, what, one of the things that i have been really pressed towards lately is just really slowing everything down and um it's partly like i've always appreciated this is like children spell love t-i-m-e and um, because they can't spell and also like, you know, time uh, we and one of the things I've started doing is actually like driving the speed limit and it deliberately inconveniencing myself in the day. So I spend more time with people and putting my phone away like and, and stuff like that. It's been on my mind a lot. And this this conversation about eating really kind of draws me into a lot of that because like I eat like a duck I basically just put food in my mouth and shake my body until it until, <laughs> until it's like in you know it's like I don't like I'm not very good at like I'm not a sociable like eater I'm a sociable person but like mm. f eating for me is is probably too mechanical um we we always have meals together as a family and we do have like jobs and like but we're not very good cooks per se I do um I do a bunch of British food at different times of year. So pasties from time to time. I always do mince pies and mm -hmm. apple pies. Uh, and my wife has recently uh, gone gluten-free for a number of reasons. And so I, I wind up, you know, baking a lot of gluten-free stuff for her as well. But not like mealtime cooking. I don't leave like a lot of casseroles and stuff. I, I'll like make something and I'll put it off on one side and we'll like eat it gradually like cookies or pancakes or something or pies. But not really you know, the night to night cooking, but that feeling, uh, what, what eating does in a way is it slows you down to give other people that time. You know, it's something you have to do. You have to do it. So like you might as well sit back and enjoy things. And it used to be that like food preparation was a substantial part of usually a woman's day and like usually like it was it was what made the whole day kind of happen and it was and and the whole day would be spent doing that and there was a slowness to it and a deliberateness to it that kind of gets lost in all of the efficiencies that we've kind of gained over time you know but some of these rich traditions still hold that and i think they benefit from that rest taken and that communion taken with each other um yeah i that's really cool i think yeah. that's that's a great place to to close us out here uh sorry you're feeling isolated rage it's okay um, hey it's characters uh it's a character study for listeners if you want to create cool characters and cool i'm not saying i'm cool cool characters and cool. uh <laughs> Um, uh, cool cultures in your worlds focus on you know why do they f uh, why are they going to be like this 
um, it, they feel isolated because they're on a new planet and they don't have their old f uh, family cooking. Uh, yeah. What kind of why is this a rich culture? Because community, they they build make everyone has a job for the food and they all come together yeah. and use yeah. a lazy susan. Sure, or they're all people of the cloth and they only eat s specific things. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. World build. <laughs> yeah. And I would just, again, repeat my challenge. Try to put too much food in your world. See if you can do it. Because I don't think you can put too much food in your world. I think you could do a chapter just describing the food people are eating. And I think, honestly, I would read that. I would read the heck out of that. And you, you would should. get to know your world so much better. And uh, it would also, if, if you're not sure, just make things up. That's what I did with the tea bowl. Um, that's what I did with the fish gruel. And it's been really fun with the players, like developing stuff like that as we've gone. So it's like, I think you can, honestly, you could start just making up food stuff and then make the culture stuff up that that was part of that later. <laughs> like, And it would be, and it would feel great. It would look really good. So um, I think that's where we'll close it out. I think this has been really, really good. Rach, thanks so much for joining me and doing this episode. I really appreciated it. Yes, of course. This was a lot of fun. I learned a lot more about you as well. Yeah, and I think I that, that is full circle. <laughs> <laughs> So that about does it for the World Craft Club. If you want to hang out with people like Rach and myself, jump on the Discord server. That is how we find each other. Uh, we have weekly meetups uh, every <laughs> every week um, <laughs> on Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, where we just hang out and talk about uh, world building stuff and also just about everything else um, so go ahead and join us on that server whenever you get a chance to it's a great place to hang out meet people uh, also we do do invites to backstage uh, at these at these sorts of uh, discussions so if we're ever doing remote interviews then you can always jump on in and uh, heckle me from the back and that'll about do it for us thanks so much for joining us in another episode of the Worldcraft Club podcast bye <laughs>